Hello and welcome to today's webcast presented by Thoroughgood. Today we'll be presenting on enterprise class solutions with the Click platform, so thank you for joining us today. I'd like to introduce today's presenters. My name is Corey Holst and I've been a consultant with Thoroughgood for just over nine years now. My Click experience involves working with consumer goods and insurance enterprise organizations on areas like application build, strategy, and implementing best practices. With me today are fellow consultants Scott Stewarts and Greg Graywall. Scott and Greg have both worked in the consumer goods space and today Scott will be highlighting some interesting demonstrations while Greg is manning the chat panel ready to answer questions that come in. Today we're going to briefly introduce Thoroughgood and then get into the core of the presentation. We'll cover and highlight new and important features on the Click platform and the transition into a conversation then on enterprise considerations. Now on to today's objectives, which include um, describing the major product offerings from Click, demonstrating basic use and capabilities of Click's BI tools uh, with a specific focus on recent updates and features that are uh, new and relevant. Finally, we'll discuss the important considerations for enterprise organizations, and that includes end-to-end -end data integration, maintaining a business-centric focus, and tackling common challenges faced by many larger enterprise organizations. Just a brief few words about Thoroughgood for those of you who may be unfamiliar with Thoroughgood. We are an independent professional services firm specializing in business intelligence and analytics solutions, strategies, and services. Founded in 1987, we operate globally from our offices in London, New York, Philadelphia, and Bangalore. We recruit and train consultants to develop a unique mix of skills, blending business understanding in the form of industry and functional experience with strong technical aptitude and a deep understanding of analytical tools and techniques. The intersection of these three core skills results in high quality services. Some of those services include areas like solution strategy, design, development, and implementation. Our clients are some of the leading organizations in the consumer goods, insurance, pharmaceutical, and banking sectors. We've included a list of some of our customers within each of those sectors to share with you the types of companies that we've helped with their business intelligence and analytics needs. Now, we are independent here at Thoroughgood in that we don't partner with just one particular technology vendor. We know that our customers use a variety and range of platforms and services, so we partner with a wide array of technology firms in the business intelligence market, and that includes back-end, front-end, and analytic-driven technologies. Since today's webcast is focusing on the Click Suite, let's talk a bit more about our partnership with Click. We're a Click Systems integrator partner and have been partners since 2009. With over 160 client projects delivered to our customers, our focus and specialty is the end-to-end -end integration of Click with major enterprise technologies to unlock data insights into any part of the organization. At this point, I'm going to turn it over to Scott, who's going to give us an introduction to the Click platform. Scott? Thank you, Corey. So now we're going to take a quick look at the variety of products that Click has to offer. ClickView focuses on guided interactive analytics through very rich applications. Generally, ClickView is used for more structured reporting, but it offers extreme customizability to users. The most recent major release is ClickView 12, and the minor release of 12.10 came out very recently. ClickSense is Click's solution for intuitive self-service visualization and data discovery. Now, ClickSense is designed so that all users can easily modify existing apps and create their own visualizations. And the latest version of ClickSense is ClickSense 3.1. End printing started off as a third-party tool that was acquired by Click, but now it's fully incorporated into the Click product line. End printing allows visualizations from a variety of Click applications to be unified into single reports. And it also allows scheduling for automated distribution of these reports in a variety of formats such as HTML, Microsoft Excel, Word, and PowerPoint, and PDFs. Last but not least, Click Data Market is a platform for finding and connecting to external data sources. It leverages a subscription model to allow rapid incorporation of the data into applications, and it's fully integrated into ClickView and ClickSense, which makes it extremely simple to use. 
And although all four of these products can add considerable value to organizations, we'll mainly be focusing on the use of ClickView and ClickSense today. So first we're going to discuss some of the most interesting features added to ClickSense in versions 3.0 and 3.1. Visual data preparation is a user-friendly visual interface for joining, for joining data sets, and it uses a smooth drag-and-drop action to do so. Visual search allows users to search metadata across all visualizations, and what this means is that labels, chart types, and descriptions are now all fair game for searches, in addition to simply searching for occurrences of specific dimensions and measures. Geographic data profiling describes ClickSense's ability to recognize city and country names and then display them on a map, and this can all be done without accompanying geographic data being loaded in, such as latitude and longitude. Also, Click has announced its acquisition of the third-party company iDevio, so we should definitely be on the lookout for even more advancements in mapping functionality and advanced geo-analytic capabilities in the coming future. Next, ClickNow has time-aware line charts in ClickSense, which means that data points across discrete and irregular time intervals can easily be rendered on a continuous time dimension. Quick change measures means that when visualizations have alternate measures, a drop-down caret now appears next to those measures to allow quickly flipping through the measures. For those of you who have used ClickView before, this would remind you a lot of cycle groups. A feature that I'm really excited about is drag and drop coloring. So users can now drop measures and dimensions onto visualizations in order to color the elements of the chart, which can make each visualization just a little bit more valuable by packing in some more information. Lastly, users can now unpivot data as it's loaded into an application, and they can do this without directly interacting with the load script. This is great for loading in pivot tables and cross tables from external sources. So now we're going to be taking a look at a demo to highlight the value of ClickSense and a couple of the new features that I just uh, covered. So for this demo, I'm going to be playing the role of an executive in a, glo in a global consumer packaged goods company. And the application that I'm going to be using today uh, is created in ClickSense Desktop version 3.1, and it can be used to analyze my company's out-of-stock information over the past few years. So before I start, let's say that I'm pretty short on time, and I remember that I have a valuable scatter plot, and it had something to do with order quantities and over-under stock ratio, but I can't really remember where I saved it or what tab I was on. So I can go up here to the top right corner and click on this Smart Search button, which is my visual search, and I can just type in Scatter and I see that my scatter plot pops up right here. So if I wanted, I could click on this uh, chart right here and go directly to the sheet on which it resides. But I'm now going to go back to the beginning of my application, and I'm going to start off on this executive dashboard, uh, which is an overview of my out-of-stock information. So up here, I have this map showing bubbles for each country and the size of the bubble, is sized by out-of-stock count and colored by percent out-of-stock. So the closer the color is to red, the higher the percentage is out-of-stock. Now, I'm particularly concerned with the Asian, uh, Asian Pacific region, so I'm going to click on Asia over in the region filter on the left-hand side, and I notice that there's a pretty large bubble on Japan and that the bubble is colored orange. So there's a lot of out-of-stock products and a high percentage are out of stock. So it seems like there's something going on in Japan here, so I'm going to click on that. Now I just want to see Japan's performance over the past month, and I look over here in the time aware line chart down at the bottom, and I can see that there's a spike here in December of 2016. So since it's a time aware line chart, I can use the scroll wheel on my mouse to scroll in and find that exact date on which it occurred. And if I had the data down in the level, I could actually scroll into time as well. Uh, so it seems like there's something going on in December of 2016. So I'm going to move on to the next tab and take a look at that month in particular. So over in the filters on the left-hand side here, I'm going to select December of 2016. 
And when I look at this bar chart of my top customers, I can see that JPIMA is by far my top customer. And that's by total orders split out by customer code. But uh, let's say that I'm you know, concerned about where these out of stock orders are from or coming from. So I'm gonna look at my quick change measures and see that I can select total out of stock orders here. And when I do that, JPIMA is no longer what I'm really concerned about. I see, I see that this JP01X customer seems to have a lot of out of stock orders. I also have this other measure, total open dollars, and that's the out of stock orders multiplied by the value of the products to see really how much money is out there out of stock. And when I do this, I can see that the, the problem is even more exaggerated here. Uh, this JP01X customer is definitely a problem. So now let's say that um, I wanted to see all this information at once. Because rather than flipping through quick change measures, I think it'd be an interesting visualization to share having this all visible at the same time. So to do that, I'm going to go over to my data and I'm going to add on this out of stock and low stock flag. And when I do that, you can see that I have a stacked bar chart, but it's pretty hard to see. There's lines splitting out the, uh, the specific bars in the stack, but it's kind of hard to tell where they're coming on. So now I'm going to drag that same flag in, and I'm going to do color by that dimension. And that's that drag and drop um, coloring that I was talking about earlier. So now it's really easy to see that although JPIMA is my top customer, this JPO1X customer is really a problem. So I'm going to select that and move on to the next tab. And if I look at my KPIs on the top right hand side, I see that there's definitely some problems going on here with this customer. But the most egregious seems to be in board games, so I'm going to select that under my brand groups. When I look at that in my scatter plot down here, um, I can see that there's a good number of products that are right around 100% as far as out of stock. Uh, so those are the products I really want to look at. So I'm going to use my lasso select tool for all these high out of stock products. And when I do that, I have those selected and I'm going to move on to the next tab where I can see some line level information about those problem products. So it really only took me a couple clicks to get from a general sense for how my company is performing as far as supply chain management to identifying these key areas and even the individual products uh, in which my region needs improvement. So this demo only showed off a sample of Click's uh, abilities, but obviously there are countless uses for a tool like this. Next, we're going to be taking a look at ClickView, specifically the updates that were found in ClickView 12. So the most significant improvement to ClickView 12 has been this back-end engine upgrade. So Click had been making some major investments into improving ClickSense, and in doing so, it developed this Kix engine, which was newer, faster, and a lot more flexible. And at the time, ClickView was still operating on its own ClickView engine, but with the release of ClickView 12, ClickView now uses the latest generation of this same Kix engine. And this lays the groundwork for future integration of ClickView and ClickSense together. Also, ClickView and ClickSense can now share QVD files, so it's really easy to share those between applications. As far as ClickView's mobile capabilities, ClickView 12, including all features of the web client, is now fully functional on touch devices. And version 12 has been accompanied by upgrades to security, clustering, and API connectivity. So with all these improvements, especially those to the underlying engine, users might be concerned about transitioning applications from older versions of ClickView to ClickView 12. But continuity and front-end functionality between these versions means that users can seamlessly upgrade to version 12 without any negative impacts on their existing applications that they had built in older versions of ClickView. And we're now going to take a little bit of time to look at a demo of ClickView 12. So as I had touched on, uh, ClickView 12 is fully functional as far as mobile capabilities. So what I'm actually going to do here is I'm screencasting an iPad, uh, and I have the ClickView application up on the iPad, and I'm screencasting that here. So that's what you're looking at here, and I'm going to navigate through uh, on the iPad. 
So for this, this application that I have here, uh, I'm playing the role of a manager within an insurance company. And the application that I have shows company performance over the past couple of years. So I'm looking to review my underwriter's performance over this past year. So first I'm going to be starting off on this underwriter snapshots, snapshot sheet. And I'm going to start by looking into the underwriter Kevin Homer. So I'm going to select him on the uh, filter over on the left-hand side. So when I look over at the bar chart here, uh, I can see his performance as far as the bar is showing um, his current year premiums and the symbol, the diamond symbol is showing past year premiums. So I can see that split out by line of business. So if I look overall at this table down on the left-hand side, his performance has been improving uh, over the past year, so that's great, but I want to see if he can improve a little bit more. So I look over and I see this other reinsurance uh, line of business. It seems like he's really dropping off from last year. So I'm going to go ahead and select other reinsurance to see what's going on there. So when I do that, I can see that there's something pretty interesting going on in the scatter plot down on the bottom right. Uh, there's, there's really two different groupings as far as the policies that he has, one uh, in the top left here and one in the bottom right. So I'm you know, pretty curious as to why this is happening and what's going on in those groupings. Uh, so I'm going to look into that a little further. So one of the great things about the uh, mobile capabilities is it really carries over all the functionality of ClickView. So I can just you know, press and hold down on my iPad to get this lasso selection here and I can accept that. And when I do that, I see over in the table on the bottom left that you know, he's definitely been improving as far as 2016 over 2015. So I'm not too concerned about that grouping there. So I'm gonna go up to the top of the screen and hit my back button. Now what I really think the problem must be coming from is this bottom right grouping. So I'm gonna select those and when I do that, I can see that his performance is really dropping off. It was around 300,000 last year and just below 150,000 this year. So I can actually, again, just press and hold on percent difference, and this menu pops up. And I'm going to sort by percent difference uh, and see that there's definitely some, some products with some problems here, uh, or some policies with some problems here. So it's probably pretty valuable to look at these policies that um, are dropping way off. So if I move over to my details page, my details sheet, I can see that I have all of the products listed out in that bottom right grouping. But I don't necessarily know that those are all the problem ones. So I'm going to move back to my snapshot page. And again, just with the pressing and holding, I can press and hold and then drag down to select these specific policies that had dropped off completely since last year. And then when I look over at the details page, I can see the specific policy numbers if I want to look into those a little further. And another cool feature is I can just tap and hold on the screen and click notes and add a new note here. And I can take a snapshot of the screen with all my filters. That way, if anybody else wants to look at these policies or I want to share this around to figure out what's going on, I can do that pretty easily. So as you can see, using an iPad or another mobile device to view the dashboards in ClickView is really simple and user-friendly. And I was able to quickly use ClickView's functionality, which carries over really smoothly to the mobile version, to drill down from a high level and look at, from looking at my underwriters and business lines into some specific policies that I want to track and look into further. And if you have any questions regarding mobile devices or other ClickView enhancements that were discussed in the slides, please reach out to us. And now I'll be turning it over to Corey for some of the enterprise considerations for companies that would like to make the most out of the Click platform. Thanks a lot, Scott. So quite often we see customers see the value in an individual Click application, but those customers will have questions about the right way to take it to the next level and support enterprise-wide functionality. How do we optimize data architecture? How do we deliver on security? How do you find that balance between freedom and governance? And at the end of the day, it's all about delivering business value. 
as an organization here at Thoroughgood, we focus on finding the intersection between business goals and the technical possibilities. And with a platform like Click, you have the ability to zoom in and zone in quickly on applications to derive value. In order to deliver on business value, you need to start by understanding what the goals of a given application are and help define what success looks like. What problems are they facing and how can data help them make better decisions? Usually, with the Click platform, this starts off with a proof of concept where you're taking a local extract and showing the possibilities through tools like ClickView and ClickSense and making sure that your measures, charts, and visuals strike at the heart of the problem that they're facing and the problem that they're trying to solve. Now, are you seeing trends in sales? Uh, can you identify top customers? Are problem areas highlighted in a way that allows them to get more information and to take action? Once you get through an initial set of iterations, then it focuses on streamlining that process, automating data refreshes, connecting to enterprise sources, licensing, etc. But all of those have the goal in mind of getting information into the hands of key decision makers. Now, one of the things that I like most about the Click set of tools is it offers a great deal of flexibility in delivering data because there is a scripting engine. Our users have instant flexibility to bring in an additional piece of data or a quick manipulation that's going to bring value, much in a way that a user might customize a formula in Excel. However, we've seen that success for enterprise customers means adopting a flexible strategy to balance governance with flexibility. Now, let's take the example of a product list like we have here. If I develop something and take an extract of products direct from my central database, great, I have it and I have the proper list. But what if Scott goes ahead and does the same thing? What if finance, planning, sales, supply chain, what if all of these groups are all taking a copy of it, but some of them are now adding an ETL process where they're manipulating things and changing things? Suddenly, what I'm calling a product category may not be the same as what you're calling a product category, and we're not talking about the same thing. So where our customers have seen success is developing a strategy of data governance, where a master extract of products exists and any new application being built utilizes that extract. I think an important point to emphasize, though, is that the goal is not about locking down data and being inflexible. The beauty of Click is that there is going to be genuine value in letting an end user add in their own context. And in this example, we've got some attributes that are coming from products. So what if they want to add in a new custom grouping or a new attribute, something that's coming from an outside Excel sheet? So uh, what, our, what the beauty of Click is is that it, you can take that data and bring it into your process and, ooh, actually, I'm going to put this into my application. Well, those attributes that are on the bottom right are being sourced from Excel. So uh, you have a group of users who, who are doing this, maybe a one-off extract, but then there's ooh, perhaps value in taking that Excel sheet and baking it into the actual process. So instead, that Excel sheet eventually finds its way into your centralized database, where then the extract process now has everyone able to take advantage of these custom fields. And you can fall anywhere in between on the spectrum. Let users add in their own data and add in their own context, or have that agile, flexible process in place to take data that was out for an individual application and centralize that into your proper productionized data sets. So we'll go into a demonstration that talks about some of these concepts, a data validation catalog, or I'm sorry, data validation application and a data catalog application, where the idea is we're going to show applications that give a, a meta quality of analysis around the data flows that happen within an organization. So first I'm going to start off with a data validation application. So the idea behind this one is, yes, we have fact data that's flowing through various different sources that are ending in various different applications, but we're using ClickView to help monitor itself. So in a normal ETL process, you might have extraction tables, you might have exception tables that kick out and, and, and go somewhere else before it even gets to the user community. You can design a similar process, and we've used Click with a customer here to help that validation process by having Click help analyze itself. 
So the idea behind this application is I've got multiple different data sources happening on specific load dates and load times, and every single thing that has been processed in the Click database, great, I want to have a history of this, I've got this history here. I can filter on specific values if I want, but the idea here is, wait a second, we want to call out where the exceptions are. So I've got two data sources here that, mm, the difference, something, something's off about this, it's not the numbers that we were anticipating based on the checks and balances that were programmed into the process. So I want to find out more about what's happened here. So I can click on this, now I've got the data very quickly boiled down to, this is where this data came from, here's your source, here's the load date, here's where the extracted, and wait a second, there's something off in terms of the validation that was happening, there's a big difference here. So now I've been able to quickly pinpoint where I've got problem areas and where there are things that I might need to address in my source files or my underlying data source. So that takes a look at the fact side of things, but what about dimensional mapping? Well, in a traditional data warehouse, you might be reinforcing referential integrity, but it only goes as far as the data that sits within that warehouse. The idea behind this is that you're providing flexibility and a structure to design a process that, that makes sense for the data coming in. Let's say you're adding in additional dimension data. Well, wait a second, I've got fact data that's coming in that's not mapped to a particular product or a particular customer or geography. So what this allows you to do is to zoom in on, well, what's going on with uh, missing SKU mappings. I can click on that, and because the Click Engine knows and has the associative engine, it says the missing SKU mappings are associated with products, and it has to do with my retailer data source. So the premise behind this is, again, using ClickView to help monitor itself in order to bring the data processes to bear that are going to help bring clarity to the organization, but not impede progress in terms of data flowing through to the applications that need it. So not only from a field mapping perspective, but a, but a duplication as well. So another way that you can validate things through the ETL process. Wait a second, you've got a, a different, uh, or you've got the same dimensional code, but I've got descriptions that, that aren't matching. So the idea behind this, again, metadata analysis around the data flows that someone from a more centralized perspective can have a view and have control over. In addition to this data catalog, another application that I wanted to, to show today was the, um, uh, the, the, the cataloging side of things. So you're using ClickView to help organize all of the QVDs and all of the QVWs that are having data flow through to the end user. So I, as a power user, now want to go and build my own new interesting application. So what I can do is, well, what do I need? I've got some interesting fact data that's coming from the marketplace. I need to merge it in with the materials that I'm familiar with. So I'm going to search material, and okay, there are two QVD names that are in the catalog that's readily accessible for me. What about G material? All right, so we can see the load date. I can take a look at the fields. It doesn't seem quite right for what I'm looking for. Well, what was that other one that we were looking for from a material perspective? So this is giving me metadata information around the fields. Oh, okay, good. I've got the brand and the material type and the hierarchy it's associated with. That seems right. Oh, okay, great. We've loaded in a sample set of the first hundred rows from each of these QVDs. Okay, the brand and the description and oh, the ID. Perfect. This is what I'm going to need to connect to at the end of the day. So in a few short clicks, I've been able to identify, I need to take my material list and merge it in. Is there a centralized place that material has already been extracted from the system? Well, great. Now I have reference to a QVD script. So me as a power user, great material. I can go and copy this script. And now I can go and paste it into a brand new application and merge in my local data, which I've got from a retailer perspective, to see if there are any interesting trends before we try to productionalize this. So the idea is giving agility and flexibility to your end business users to not just be stuck with, you have to take it from the database, everyone needs a fresh extract, you have to query it every time. The idea is that you're building in flexible layers for your business community users and helping see the lineage of this uh, QVD. Where did material come from? Came from this particular QVW transformation. Oh, look at these QVDs. One of them is the G material. So, all right, so the G material, what's the origin of this one? Oh, it comes from my SAP extract. And I can see down the line where it goes and where it hits. 
And I'd like to look at material again. Oh, it's also being used by that material analysis QVD and the one that we're merging in with our Salesforce data. So I'm pretty confident this is the QVD that I'm going to need. Now, as I build out that application and I push it through our production process, eventually my new application is going to show up here on the list because, again, we're using ClickView metadata to drive this particular application. So those were two quick looks at um, something that I found to be interesting, developing a click application with a customer that takes the metadata behind any extract and presents various user interfaces where we can see the structures, see sample data, and generate syntax so that when my power users are out there building a new application, they're using the same data set, they see the lineage of where that data came from. Another area where we see enterprise customers have questions is around security. Um, how do you get secure data and how do you get it in the hands of the people who need it while keeping others out? There are two main forms of security that the Click platform offers. The most basic is application level security. So at the start, you can open up applications to anyone who has a Click license. However, you can start to customize this access on an application by application basis so that individuals can access only the apps that are meant for them. Typically, we see, say, finance or HR applications more traditionally locked down so only the relevant users can see them. If you let them have access to an application, they have the ability to see all data that exists within that app. So that moves on to the next type of security, row-level security, and Click also has you covered here. You can create a single application that has the entire pool of data available, but set up what is known as section access. This allows you to apply a security filter so that when a user enters who's only supposed to see a single region or a single product, they see that information. Enterprise customers need to think about their approach. How are you going to be applying the security? Will you store those settings locally or through a centralized database? Will you take advantage of things like Active Directory groups to make the addition and subtraction of individual people easier to maintain moving forward? So we've helped customers adopt and grow the approaches that make sense for them and their organization. Now, along with security, uh, quite often what we have are questions around globalization. So to highlight this, on the left we're representing a central solution where everything is baked into a single application to be used by everyone. So regardless of geography or business focus, within this central application, you have a single access that everyone accesses. Perhaps you have filters that exist within the application to focus on here's North America, here's my area around planning, here's my area around marketing. Perhaps it's broken into multiple uh, different solutions, but the idea is that one solution that everyone globally is trying to access. Um, so on the right, we start to get into this concept of, of breaking that out to be more flexible for individual users or individual needs. So perhaps you can layer in some of the security considerations that were discussed on the previous slide. But the idea is that you spin off applications. So for example, in the UK, you can make specific adjustments to data in the front end to serve their needs, which might be different than data coming in for the US. We have uh, examples that we've seen with customers. Um, we've got our own hierarchy for how we group products here in Europe, which is different than the centralized product list that's coming from our master data. Well, the idea is that you're blending it in and presenting an application which is genuinely useful and, going back to a few slides ago, genuinely serving the business need at the end of the day. So. These are just two quick views here of when you might want to use it. So from the determining factor point of view, well, what, when would you want to try to globalize a solution? So some factors typically include areas like, is it a single business process? What if you're mostly on a single process but you need some flexibility? This might push you towards a more decentralized solution. What about getting to agreement and alignment? If there is a way of viewing things, and this is globally how it needs to be done, that might put you in the centralized solution category. If not, there are other things that can be done to break that solution out to uh, multiple views and something that's flexible for the business community. Things that really shouldn't push you in one decision or the other, the idea of data latency, imports or, or refreshings, or the uh, language translation. These are things that can be factored into a more globalized solution. 
So I think what we wanted to show quickly here is the idea of Great, you've got the idea of a globalized and a centralized solution, but going back to our data catalog here, I've got my material QVD, I'm going to take a look at my script, and now I want to start something brand new. So, in a standard brand new click app, oh, yeah, it's, a, it's a blank application. And then I go into my script and, ooh, I'm not connected up to any of my main data sources. So. What do we do and what are services that, that we've helped our customers provide? The idea of a, of a template. So this is an example of a starter template that an organization can use that is purpose-built for the particular customer. What we've done in the script here is have connections that exist already to the centralized pool of QVDs that people are going to need. Also, centralized connections to um, uh, storage files that are related to color settings and other settings that exist within the application so that when I start, I'm not starting with something completely blank. I'm starting with something that already has the template and the layout that my organization has approved of, but notice I don't have a specific data connection, but they've helped out by giving some example charts. I've got some uh, examples here for this is my starting point, which is a lot simpler than uh, just starting out with something completely brand new. And there's also flexibility. So your organization needs to decide how you're going to approach uh, getting ClickView out to the masses in terms of enabling individual power users to go and create something new and interesting. Are you going to be completely locked down in your process to say it has to look like this, there's no flexibility whatsoever, or is it more of a laissez-faire policy where I'm giving it to the user like this and go and be flexible with it and there are some approval processes that are in place to get it up to the server. Again, the idea is I want to give a flexible tool with as little impediment as possible in order for users to create something brand new and interesting that's going to derive business value. I'll turn it back to the slides here and uh, we'll have a brief look at licensing. Licensing certainly can be the topic of its own video, but the answer for an individual organization is going to be nuanced. With ClickView, you have the local desktop license for developers, but when you get to server, there are areas like document, user, and session cals. On the ClickSense side, they introduced a free desktop tool with a token component to server. Now you add an end printing and data market. What do you use? How do you optimize? We've helped customers figure out optimal strategies for them that balance out cost with application delivery and access. If this topic is of particular interest, please reach out to us via the chat panel and happy to guide you through the possibilities. Last topic we'll briefly cover is data integration. Click has the ability to connect to a world of different sources, and quite often we see enterprise customers need to connect to traditional warehouses, flat file sources like Excel, and we're seeing the space emerge for areas like cloud, social, and even big data platforms like Hadoop. Most important for our enterprise customers is the ability to connect to enterprise warehouses like SQL Server, SAP, Oracle, and Teradata. Now, add on the flexibility of local sources like Excel. There are all sorts of other sources out there that can be accessed through the native ODBC drivers, web connectors, or REST APIs. Um, and I think one of the more interesting potentials around delivering Click is through other channels. You, of course, have the native server delivery access through a web browser, but what if you can integrate Click into websites? What about SharePoint, data catalogs, and even areas like Salesforce? We've hosted a series of recent webcasts that cover these topics, so if any of them are interest, please certainly get in touch. We're happy to pass along the links to those videos or talk with you about what your particular need is. So we know that this has been a whirlwind tour and discussion of the possibilities with the Click platform. What we hope today is that you saw uh, some of the possibilities with Click. Um, the latest features and releases, and seeing the potential for what Click means to larger enterprise organizations. Um, what I want to just put out there is, if you have any more info, if you want any more information about today's topic and how we at ThoroughGood can help you, we've listed the services and engagements that we provide to our customers up on the screen here. If any of these topics are of interest, please certainly reach out via email here, and happy to pick up a conversation with any of our attendees today. Thank you for joining us and we hope everyone has a great day.